Hey guys, welcome back. TJ here with Dead History, and welcome back to part two of our presidential series. Part nine, we're taking a look at the, what president, Henry? Tenth president. Tenth president, who is it? John Tyler. John Tyler, very good. I got my son Henry here with me. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> and we're going to jump right in here. So, as I said, John Tyler, born uh, at Greenway Plantation there in Charles City County, Virginia uh, in 1790. So, you know, not much really known uh, about his his childhood, just kind of a, a pretty basic childhood from what I would imagine. Came from a pretty wealthy family, as I said. Uh, now, very interesting thing. Uh, basically, John Tyler set up presidential succession as we know it. Um, I'm sure, you know, as you guys probably remember from our uh, part eight video, uh, which was about William Henry Harrison, uh, he, he died while in office. Uh, only about 31, 32 days into his presidency, William Henry Harrison. John Tyler was his vice president. So Harrison's death brought up really kind of an odd situation for the federal government. For the first time ever, a president had died in office, and it wasn't entirely clear how the succession situation would play out. So really nobody knew what to do. Uh, you know, the federal government was like, well, what do we do? This hasn't happened yet to us. So... Amid all the confusion, Tyler declared that he had full presidential powers. He arranged to be sworn in, and he gave an inaugural address while downplaying any talk of being, quote-unquote, a temporary president. Because that's what they thought. I guess a lot of people in government, they had thought that really it was going to be temporary. Like, Tyler would take over for the time being, and then they would find basically a successor. But Tyler made it very clear, uh-uh. I'm now president. And since it was only a month into William Henry Harrison's term, John Tyler literally did a full four-year term, basically. So, uh, and although his opponents, they dubbed Tyler his accidency. Accidency. Yeah, because basically it was an accident how he became president. Uh, and that his rise to power would set the basic standard for presidential succession that it would eventually be form, uh, formalized in 1967 with the 25th Amendment. So Tyler's plan wasn't exactly the same as the one we have now, though he spent the rest of his term without a vice president. So, um, yeah, so he was, he became president when uh, William Henry Harrison died. So then he, of course, got the nickname His Accidency. And when you have that kind of nickname, you're kind of working already behind the eight ball as a politician, I'd say. So, um, and that was really actually the least of Tyler's problems, his, his uh, kind of clever and, and not so nice nickname. Um, he had been elected as part of the Whig Party ticket, uh, but his actual politics didn't always mesh well with the actual Whig doctrine. Uh, Tyler had strong states' rights leanings, uh, and these beliefs made him butt heads with party big wigs in the uh, Whig Party, such as Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. The two guys I'm showing you here, Henry Clay, boom. And Daniel Webster, boom. So there you go. He butted heads with them because he believed, Tyler believed that states had a right to determine what they wanted to do for their state. And that was it. And the federal government should not butt in, especially when it came to slavery. Tyler was a supporter. He was an enslaver himself. He owned slaves. He actually uh, uh, seceded uh, from the Union with Virginia, his home state. So we're going to get into that. Uh, so anyway, uh, thanks to basically the philosophical differences, Tyler earned a slew of dubious presidential firsts. Uh, when Tyler twice vetoed a national banking act that Henry Clay was desperately trying to pass, the Whigs expelled him from their party, a definite first for a sitting president, and then his entire cabinet, except for the Secretary of State Daniel Webster, they resigned in retaliation over Tyler's policies. Yeah, so his entire cabinet, with the exception of his secretary of state, they all said, bye-bye, we're out of here. So it, it gets better and worse, too. In 1842, Tyler's former allies introduced the first impeachment resolution against the sitting president over his use of veto powers. So as we all know, in our modern-day times, we are very, very familiar with impeachment because not only did our current sitting president Donald Trump just get impeached for the second time, which is a first. We also had William 
Jefferson Clinton, Bill Clinton, get impeached back in the 90s, which really wasn't that long ago. So we are very familiar with uh, uh, impeaching. So this was a first, obviously, with Tyler. Representative John Quincy Adams led a committee that found Tyler had improperly used his veto, but the resolution failed. Congress had the last laugh, though. Tyler became the first president to have his veto overridden by the legislature when Congress overrode him on a minor shipbuilding bill on his last day in office. So very interesting stuff. A lot of contention uh, over Tyler and uh, him being president. His accidency, as they said. So Henry loves that. So uh, also Tyler, he basically, uh, he annexed Texas. Uh, t- Texas declared its independence from Mexico in 1836, and Tyler's term in office um, it was basically it, it was its own independent republic. But Mexico, though, still claimed the Lone Star State as part of its territory. But Tyler pushed hard for the annexation of Texas, and he, as his term was expiring in early 1845, the Senate finally approved a joint resolution in favor of the annexation by a very slim 27 to 25 vote margin. So Tyler signed the Texas statehood bill into law on March 1st, 1845, a mere three days before the end of his presidential term. And the city Tyler, Texas is named after the president who helped get the state into the union. So pretty interesting stuff that I'm sure not a lot of people know. Uh, What else? Of course, I already said Tyler unfortunately was a slave owner. Uh, He was part of the Confederacy. Uh, He basically, he went along with Virginia, like I said, his native state. He seceded from the Union. He was actually also elected to the Confederate Congress, the Confederate House of Representatives. So we're going to touch on that here in a second. So pretty unbelievable stuff, Um, you know, as I said, from from what we were used to for the first, you know, nine presidents. Uh, Pretty, pretty unbelievable stuff. Um, Here, I will actually just touch on this now. John Tyler was the only president who sided with the secessionists. He, after working toward and failing to come up with a di- diplomatic solution, Tyler chose to join the Confederacy and was elected to the Confederate Congress as a representative from Virginia. But he died on January 18th of 1862 before attending the first session of the Congress. And because of this, Tyler was seen as a traitor. Um, literally, he was he was basically, you know, the, the North and the Union and the uh, federal government. They looked at Tyler like, you're nothing but a traitor. So uh, pretty crazy stuff. Before I get fully into that, I do want to touch on, of course, as I mentioned, his first wife, Letitia Christian Tyler. She died while uh, in office while Tyler was president. She was actually the very first first lady to die. Uh, she was the first lady to die in the White House. She died peacefully. She was only 51 years old. It was on the evening of September 10th, 1842 from a stroke. She actually had had like two strokes. So, um, yes. Hey, guys. TJ here. Uh, And what I'm actually at, that grave right there with the American flag, you can see the house in the background. This is actually the grave of... First Lady Letitia Tyler, John Tyler's first wife. This is Letitia Tyler who died while she was First Lady. She was the very first First Lady to die in office, to die in the White House. So, and if you see behind, that's the plantation house. This is actually on private property, so uh, we're going to make this kind of short here, but... So there you go, there's Letitia Tyler. And I will uh, put up a little blurb on the screen while I'm showing this that, um, of what the, uh, and there's some other grave sites here, what the uh, name of the plantation is, it escapes my uh, recollection. But this is actually where Letitia was born. So this is the family plantation where she was born. And this is her final resting place. The very first first lady to die in office. Thanks for joining, guys. So pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, she was actually she's buried at the plantation of her birth, uh, which is I believe it's called uh, Cedar Grove Plantation in uh, 
New Kent County in Virginia. That's where she's buried. Um, so pretty interesting stuff. She was the first. Now, the interesting thing is, after she had died, uh, President John Tyler, listen to this story, on February 28th of 1844, while a demonstration cruise was underway aboard the USS Princeton, one of its big guns, it was named the Peacemaker, exploded. And several VIPs, very important people that were on board, were killed, including former Senator David Gardner. His daughter, Julia, Julia Gardner, who had been standing nearby, was carried to safety by U.S. President John Tyler. Four months later, they were secretly married. Julia, she was dubbed and nicknamed the Lady Presidentress. She was 30 years younger than John Tyler. So she was the first lady to actually be photographed. She was the first to have her own press agent. And she was the first to dance in public at the White House. Wherever she went, she was accompanied by 12 maids of honor, six on each side, all dressed alike. So this bell, oh, there's my alarm. I apologize in the background there. This bell that you're seeing on your screen right now, that is actually what they call the deadly love boat bell of the USS Princeton. Uh, this is actually in Princeton, New Jersey. It's right at Princeton Borough Hall. It's right outside the Borough Hall. The bell from the Princeton, it's the only surviving memento other than the eternal love of John and Julia Tyler, of course. But it's the only artifact that survived from that explosion on the USS Princeton. And this, these are those photos that you're seeing on your screen now from when I visited the bell. So pretty interesting stuff. little cool fun fact. Um, what else can I tell you before we kind of wrap things up here? John Tyler, we already know. Um, oh, yes. And, of course, as I said, he was the... Uh, the, the first president to basically not be recognized by the federal government. Um, he was considered a traitor, as I said. Um, so basically, after Tyler's tumultuous presidency ended, his political career was pretty much shot. Uh, in 1862, the obituary that was in the New York Times described Tyler as the most unpopular public man that had ever held any office in the United States. And even that depiction might have been a bit charitable. Tyler did manage to maintain some popularity throughout the South, though. So when the Confederacy broke away at the start of the Civil War, Tyler found himself, of course, like I told you, elected to the Congress of the Confederate States. But he died before he could take a seat. Um, and President Lincoln didn't issue a proclamation mourning when Tyler passed. And flags did not dip to half sta staff on federal properties, just like they always do. That did not happen. The Confederacy, on the other hand, they threw a lavish funeral for Tyler and Richmond, including a 150-carriage procession. So, pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, interesting stuff. It, it Basically, I have a lot of really interesting facts. Now what you're seeing on your screen is you're actually seeing the, um, the grave site at the Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia of John Tyler. And I'm going to read something to you guys real quick. That is very interesting about his death and his funeral. So here you go. So I'm actually going to read a, a bit of a little excerpt, excerpt from uh, the book The President is Dead by Louis Pacone, uh, who's actually a, a New Jersey guy just, uh, just like me. So excellent book if anybody's interested in presidential history of their death and their grave sites and that sort of thing. This book is the best out there. Um, so here you go. I'm just going to uh, read this word for word for you. Uh, the grave was unmarked at the time of the burial with plans to place a marker at a later date. Virginia passed a resolution to erect a suitable monument, but the state was never, quote unquote, in funds. And it remained unmarked with the only landmark of distinction being a small nearby magnolia tree, leading the few visitors to ask the superintendent of the cemetery for directions. He would basically oblige and he would point them to the president's hill where tyler was buried near james monroe uh then instruct them to locate the grave of tyler's daughter and look for the nearby mound of dirt uh the contrast between the two graves was striking monroe's prominent memorial of course while peculiar in, in appearance it's often called the birdcage 
it was appropriate for 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 former president. Tyler's grave was just an aesthetic. Uh, it was just a, a, an unmarked mound of dirt, um, and it wasn't just a concern of the the appeal or the aesthetic of it. It had the cemetery records ever been destroyed, the exact location of his grave, it would have been lost forever. So, 37 years later in 1899, the United States uh, Congress felt the time had come to mark the grave with a suitable monument and attempted to allocate $10,000 to build one. However, not all were ready to memorialize the secessionist president, and the proposal failed. Uh, the Hollywood Cemetery, where he's where he's buried there in Richmond, they decided to act, and in October of that same year, in 1899, uh, they basically cre uh, erected a modest marker out of, out of uh, local granite, and it was small and simple, and the date of his death was listed as January 17th, was incorrect. Yeah, and it bore, this is what it said, it bore the following inscription. John Tyler, President of the United States from 1841 to 1845. He was born in Charles City County, Virginia, March 29th of 1790, and he died at Richmond, Virginia, January 17th of 1862. But that's not correct. <laughs> John Tyler uh, did not that that he was actually he actually died on January 18th of 1862. So anyway, uh, a decade later, um, they finally came up with enough funds to make what you see here on your screen, this big, tall obelisk monument. Um, it basically was in December 16th of 1913. They held a design competition, and after reviewing 25 submissions, the contract was awarded to T.F. McGann & Sons Company of Boston, who designed uh, the 17-foot-tall granite shaft topped by a bronze sculpture uh, of a Greek urn supported by two eagles. Uh, so, yeah, it was on Saturday, June 9th of 1915 that the monument was placed over Tyler's grave without a uh, ceremony. So, yeah, so basically his grave was unmarked for many years. And then his grave was also just a small little headstone that was not actually accurate and was not actually correct at all. Uh, the death date was wrong. Uh, and then it took years. So... Lincoln did not recognize his death. He did not make an announcement of it. He did not fly the stags, uh, flags at half staff. Nothing. And then our own federal government just didn't recognize it for many years. Um, and another really, really interesting fact about his, uh, his, his grave and everything else and his funeral, um, he is actually the only U.S. president uh, to not have... Uh, a, a, an American flag draped over his uh, casket in his coffin. It was actually a Confederate flag. Uh, Jefferson Davis, who obviously was the uh, Confederate president, he was very, very instrumental in uh, basically getting this uh, this this funeral and these the ceremony and the procession arranged, and, and uh, it was marched in to. The Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia, the procession and his casket had a Confederate flag draped over it. He's still the only president to this day to not have an American flag draped over his coffin or casket uh, during his funeral procession. He's the only one. So, yeah, pretty crazy. Um, so that kind of shows you a little bit about who John Tyler was. Uh, obviously not... Uh, not someone who believed in federal government butting in too much, believed in states' rights unequivocally, and definitely big part of his state rights, uh, you know, lead in March that he, his stance that he took was because of slavery. He did not want the federal government, like su such as the Missouri Compromise, he hated it. Hated it, hated it, hated it. He did not think the federal government should butt in to any states and states' rights when it came to slavery. It should be a state issue. So, and yeah, so there you go. That tells you a bit about John Tyler and who he was. I know this video was a little long. I apologize. You're probably saying, come on, it's John Tyler. What, what's it to say? TJ with Dead History. And I'm actually here at Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia. You can actually probably hear behind me the James River that's 
that river down there flowing pretty hard, the San Henry. And right here we are actually standing at the gravesite of the 10th President of the United States, John Tyler. So I'm going to flip you guys around. So this is John Tyler's gravesite right here at Hollywood Cemetery. And this is actually uh, family members of Tyler's. Uh, right behind him you can actually see that really cool looking thing back there. That's actually President James Monroe. We're going to go see him in a second. So, signing off for now. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History. And this behind me, this parking garage, is actually the site of where... Let me flip it. This is the site. This parking garage stands on what was... The Exchange Hotel, and on January 18th, 1862, I believe it was January 18th of 1862, this is the site and location where the 10th President of the United States, John Tyler, died. Uh, he fell ill while he was uh, here at the hotel, and they thought he was doing a little better, and the plan was for him to eventually um i guess within a day or so go back to his sherwood forest plantation uh but he f got worse his condition worsened and he died where this location was uh, i think a better view of it is really on the other side uh so like on the back end of this i'll try to go get a few pictures of that but this is it. This is the parking garage that stands where the Exchange Hotel once was that John Tyler died at. So, thanks for joining, guys. guys, TJ with Dead History here, actually behind me, it's actually a uh, big statue of George Washington. But, that right there, that is the church, let me flip you guys, that our 10th president, John Tyler's funeral was held at. This is actually, I believe it's St. Paul's Episcopal Church, and this is the church that Tyler's Yep, St. Paul's Episcopal Church that uh, Tyler's funeral was held at. So pretty cool stuff. Actually, I'll get a real good uh, view when I go across the street here. So, so back again. So there you go. There's the church right there. That is the church that John Tyler's funeral was held at. So our 10th president. So thanks for stopping in guys. that I hit the wrong button I was turning you guys around because I am actually at Sherwood Forest the plantation and the home of the 10th president John Tyler so this is John Tyler's home I believe he lived here for about 20 years uh, I want to say it was from about 1842 to 1862 that's when he died was 1862 so this was his home for about 20 years um, and it is still maintained to this day by the Tyler family. 
as uh, I told you, he has a living grandson who's 93, who is not in the greatest health, but his great-grandson, um, whose name is William, I believe his name is William Tyler, uh, he's often here at the plantation, so pretty interesting stuff. So there it is right there, the home. And this is the, I think it's 300 feet long. I believe it's the longest home or longest structured home in, in America. Um, believe it or not, like in length. So it's quite large. There it is right there. Very cool. So there you go. That's the 10th president, John Tyler's home here at Sherwood Forest in Virginia. Take a look around a little bit and then uh, head out of here. But there you go. Just wanted to show you guys. Thanks for uh, joining. I visited a few fun places. I wanted to show you some cool stuff about his grave, uh, some interesting facts, and there you go. So I hope you enjoyed part nine of our presidential series, uh, looking at the uh, 10th president of the United States, John Tyler. And Henry and I thank you, right, Henry? Yes, of course, thank you. And pretty crazy, right, that John Tyler did not have an American flag on his coffin, right? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It is crazy, I know. So stay tuned next week. We are going to change our format a bit. We're going to change the title of our videos. I'm not going to call them the presidential series anymore. They're going to be on a playlist on YouTube that is marked presidential series. So be on the lookout for a video that I'm going to do uh, basically explaining the new format. So you guys can see we're still going to go in order. Next week's still going to be James Polk, the 11th president. We're going to continue in order, but we're just going to rename things a bit. We're going to kind of change that up a bit. So, uh... That's about it. But thank you very much for watching and subscribing and leaving your comments. And we will see you next week. Right, Henry? Bye. Yes, bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye now.